good morning everyone and thank you for being here such early in the morning this is the first session we are starting the day on uh, hall one and this is my extreme privilege uh, to be able to do this uh, with my mentors uh, dr ashish sharma he has been my mentor throughout the journey and he has made me stand over here and then i have support from dr john davis who, who is always encouraging throughout the journey and then uh, during this journey uh, i got connected with dr prakhyat and dr swati ma'am and uh, uh, it, it, it has been a, a great journey. This is the third year we are doing this IC. And uh, I, I think uh, this the idea behind this IC uh, was to uh, find, like to encourage people how to find their innovation, how to get that idea, and then how to uh, take it forward. Be it you want to do it yourself, or you want to uh, commercialize it, or you want to do a 3D printing, or you want to do artificial intelligence, whatever you want. There are multiple ways to go ahead. And uh, the idea behind uh, this was to just to showcase that everybody, every innovator is just a normal person with an idea, but only has an extra courage to take it forward. So uh, uh, let me introduce uh, to the panel. Uh, as I said, Dr. Ashish Sharma is an innovator par excellence. He has innovated uh, MI RedCam. And, uh, He's uh, working on multiple other uh, things. He has uh, initiated a Diabetic Brain Free India initiative, which is uh, right now taking place in Coimbatore and in pilot stages in other uh, places. And there are multiple other innovations in pipeline with him. Uh, then uh, we have Dr. John Davis Akara, who is uh, uh, what I call a, se a serial innovator. Uh, he just keeps innovating and presenting every year uh, with one or two innovations. So he is a cataract refractive surgeon in uh, Western Eye Hospital and Chaitanya Eye Hospital, Kochi. And he has won multiple awards. I think in innovation community, we don't need an introduction for him. Uh, then we have Dr. Swati Ma'am. Uh, she is heading uh, the uh, LVPI Center uh, in Hyderabad. and. Uh, uh, the, she is the head of uh, eye cancer and she has a keen interest in ocular oncology. She has innovated a surgical technique which she presented in the last two years and this year she is back with her talk on artificial intelligence in ocular oncology. And then we have Dr. Prakhyat. He is uh, also an innovator. He has innovated ND ring, that is negative dysphotosia ring, uh, a topic that is bothering everyone but nobody bothered actually to uh, solve it. But he took it forward and made a, a, a actually a commercial device that solves that problem. So with that introduction, uh, I'll start with the, uh, with my talk. I am Dr. Nilesh Kumar. I have innovated DIGS Pro under guidance of Dr. Ashish Sharma. And uh, uh, I am going to talk about how you are going to f uh, find your germinal idea. So these are my financial disclosures. So uh, just to give a brief introduction, what my uh, innovation has been, it is a completely slit lamp independent world's first smartphone based uh, gonio imaging device so it just uses a smartphone camera there is an optics in the housing and then there is your uh, gonio lens most compatible with uh, four mirror and six mirror but works with two mirror and three mirror as well and it is compatible with all major uh, smartphones that are available so this is how it has it is set up for use you just uh, take a gonio lens screw it into your adapter that adapter is perfectly aligned with the housing segment, so you don't have to uh, uh, get uh, like be bothered with the alignment. Just open your camera app, and then you are set to go. And this is how you acquire the image. Just as a normal uh, gonio lens, you put this with the housing, and uh, on the patient's eyes, just ask the patient to look straight, align it, and click it, and you get a four mirror, a complete four mirror, uh, 360 degree image using uh, six mirror and are nearly uh, uh, 360 degree based on the uh, four mirror. So these are some sample images. You can see uh, open angle, you can see uh, peripheral anterior synechia and you can see uh, silicon bubble all uh, imaged with DIGS Pro. This, these images are using uh, three mirror gonio lens. But the uh, main question is how did this happen and how does anything happen? We get a lot of idea. We get a lot of idea. The most two common uh, question, common questions asked to any innovators are, how did you get that idea and how did you decide to take it forward? I will try to answer those two questions in today's presentation based on my learning from my interaction with other innovators. So everyone has got ideas. When presented with a problem, any logical mind will give you a solution. So anyone in the audience who wants to innovate, focus on finding that problem. That is the key point. Focus on finding the problem that is very close to you 
and that you really want to be solved for yourself. When you find when you find that it is for yourself and you want to solve it, you will take it forward, and then your brain will do the magic. So my problem was convincing the patient that they have closed angles and they needed YAC PI. <coughs> it's a very uh, difficult thing to explain a patient that has walked into your clinic just to get a refraction and tell them that, okay, you are supposed to go blind if you don't get this procedure. So it, it, it bothers them. They are, they are suddenly uh, uh, worried that why this doctor is telling and somebody, they might also think that this doctor wants to make some money out of me by doing a simple laser. <coughs> so the only way to convince them was to show images and there was no viable solution to show them their angle. So I just wanted to solve that problem. What did my brain threw up? What is a gonio mirror? Is it a normal mirror? Don't we all take this? In gym, we take gym selfies. What is it? We are just imaging a mirror. Similarly, can't we image a gonio mirror? That was the solution that came into the gym. This is my college gym. But it is not that I just got an idea in the evening and next day the DIGS was born. It took me 8 to 10 days to gather the courage to take the first picture. I took that patient in a dark room. Nobody was there. I was clicking the image. First image when I was clicking, Dr. Ashish Sharma walks in and is like, what are you doing? And that, that even before the DIGS was born, he walked in, he was like, what are you doing? I told him, sir, this is an idea that I have got. And he, he got so excited, he was even more excited than me. And then uh, he is like, we, will, we have to work on it, we have to work on it. And then the journey uh, came forward. So Ikigai is a Japanese philosophy, the reason of being. The, why I am telling this? Because if you have an idea and you have a solution, then you have to go the Ikigai way. The four questions are, do you, have, uh, uh, do you love what you are doing? Are you good at it? Does the world need it? And is anyone willing to pay for it? These are the four questions that will answer what way you are going to take forward. So two questions are answered. Do you love doing it? You have a problem that you want to solve. So you love doing it. Are you good at it? If you have solved, you are good at it. So these two questions are out of, uh, like they are uh, solved. Now you have to do a survey to see if your world needs that idea or is it very pertinent to yourself. If it is only pertinent to you, then don't take it commercial. But show it to everybody that this is a solution. Maybe few people might need it. So that is the way and you can go the DIY way. And if anybody is willing to pay for it, take it commercial. If you think that this is a problem and uh, the, prop the solution is for 10 lakhs, you are giving it for 1 lakh or 50,000, then give, uh, just commercialize it. So it took 12 prototype. This is, if you, if you love doing what you do, this, this, what, this is what happens. That is the first image that I took what I was telling about. From first image to uh, 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 get to this image on the uh, center one, it took 12 prototypes. At, uh, we took 12 macro lenses of Amazon. We pasted it on the smartphone and we tried uh, different modalities and we, uh, we took that center image. The next question to be answered is, are you good enough to implement your ideas? This decides the route that you're going to take to develop your idea. So DIY, as I told, if only you want to do it or few people want to do it, go the DIY. DIY. The industry partners comes in when you want to commercialize and having a mentor is of utmost importance. If you find a mentor, it is, it is like nothing. Uh, the journey that uh, uh, generally takes that what uh, took Ashish sir around uh, five years, it took only two years for me because he has made all the, uh, he, he knows how to steamroll your way into the uh, system now. So it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes very important to get a right mentor. But it is not that if you don't have a right mentor, you can't do it. He did it without a mentor. So uh, it can also be done like that. Now, uh, to find out, does your world need it? So uh, what we did is a survey. And uh, we saw that there are no viable options available. There was a 3D OCT reconstruction for anterior segment and it was like prototyping stage and it costed around 40 lakhs. There was a machine to take uh, from NIDEC to take GONIO images that was 25 lakhs. What we did, we wanted to give something for very cheap, 25, 30,000, 40,000. So that provoked us to go further and to go the commercial way. We published the technique in Journal of Glaucoma to and the quality of the image was good enough to go on the cover art. So the last question, 
really decides where your innovation needs to go, commercial or not, simple. Are you willing to pay for it? How did we get to know? Once we published that article, everybody was asking, do you have a device to do this? When we told that, no, no, because the publication was on handheld, it was not on, a, uh, on the device. So everybody was like, do you have a device to do it? Please provide us a device, we are willing to pay for it. So that answered the question. So uh, any research that has to go, has to be self-sustainable so that it pay, pays for itself. You don't make commercial uh, angle out of it. You don't get money. That's why we have kept it frugal and very low cost. So just it pays for itself. We don't take any monetary benefit out of it. That way it reaches to more people and it uh, helps us uh, to grow further. But should we stop? Now we have a device. It is patented. It is commercialized. Should we stop? The beauty, beauty of what you do and you are learning what you do is that you are not going to stop even after winning multiple awards. The next frontier is to uh, get a reflection-free image so that there is no uh, uh, reflection of uh, flash, there is no uh, interference from any out, out light. So this, this is what we are striving for. for. Apart from this, we are working to get a 3D uh, Gonio image camera so that if you put a stereoscopic glasses on, you will get the angle in 3D. So these two frontiers we are working on, hopefully in next one or two years we are going to achieve uh, these two. And this brings us to the main thing. What you are doing, love your idea. I absolutely love my idea. That is my favorite. And that's why this germinal idea is continuing to grow further. Thank you for your patient listening. Keep innovating, keep translating, keep digging. So a uh, little change of uh, order. Uh, we will have a panel discussion at the end uh, because there are multiple various uh, frontiers uh, which will be open to you. So uh, Dr. John Davis Akara will be going uh, second. He is going to uh, talk about using 3D printing for your uh, innovation and how to rapid prototype your innovation. So over to Dr. John. morning session I think maybe a few people went for the glaucoma walk as well I'm dr. John Davis Akara thank you to dr. Nilesh for organizing this session so like he said for the past three years we have been doing this session and uh, it's something which uh, is an unmet need and so I hope you get more audience so while, while uh, tech is being sorted out, I'll just tell you about the innovator mindset. So uh, like Dr. Nilesh said, you need to love your idea. You need to, uh, you know, you need to believe in it. You need to figure out so many things about it. So that's something which all innovators, all people with ideas need to know. Sometimes you get failures and uh, you need to work through them. Okay. So I'll just start off with one very useful skill that will help you to bring your ideas to reality. You might have a lot of ideas and you might be able to go to an engineer and talk to them and get it done, but it is very useful to at least know the basics of some of these technologies so that you can prototype these things yourself. Because there is always a gap when you have an idea, you need to go find somebody, talk to them, translate what you are talking to the language that they understand and I'm not talking English, Malayalam, Tamil, Hindi. It's, it's a different language. What doctors speak and what engineers speak are actually not the exact same language. And uh, if you know how these things work, the basics, then you will be able to better understand how to communicate, what are the things that are easy for them to do, what are the hard parts, what are the, you know, small things which will add a lot of value to your product, things like that. So 3D printing is one very useful technology which you will need to know. In addition to software development and, uh, you know, uh, smartphone app development and other things. So well, let's start. If you notice, uh, this is a 3D model of a chopper and uh, the new, newest version of PowerPoint can incorporate that as well. So you can import 3D models, you can download 3D models from uh, my uh, pages on the NIH uh, website, that is uh, 3d.nih.gov. 
you can scan this QR code if you want the website and on the right side here yeah right side anatomical left but yeah right side uh, you have the QR code for Thingiverse page and uh, financial interest I am developing some products in this which I am uh, going to commercialize and many of the other things on these pages are free open source uh, so that will come under the Creative Commons license, CCBY most of that is you just need to attribute that's all. So you can use it for yourself, you can use it for commercial purposes also but you can use it. So again 3D if you want to put 3D models in your PowerPoint presentations you can do that also that will be the first step okay. You just download it and put it in your PowerPoint presentation, insert 3D model from device got it. So 3D printing is a technology where physical objects are created from digital files. So this is very confusing to people who are new to 3D. They think that you know maybe you take a 3D photograph and print that. No. You create things. So if you say 3D printing it might confuse people. This is 3D manufacturing. It is additive manufacturing that we are using in 3D printing and subtractive manufacturing is used for CNC machining. That is you take a block of metal and it the CNC machine cuts out the parts which are not required that is subtractive. This is additive that is you don't waste any material you put layer by layer and make a physical object. And uh, there are many techniques so Fuse deposition modeling is the most uh, uh, easily available one. It uses filaments and this is how it works. You design something, you use software to slice it and you print it, technically print. Then some of the things you need processing. So for example if it's uh, uh, F FDM, not much processing required but you do processing you can get a much smoother finish, much better devices. You can actually uh, instead of taking it as a prototype you can take it as a final product if you do finishing it properly post processing properly resin needs a little more post processing. So materials used the most common materials are PLA and ABS you can use nylon PT you have flexible materials so many options you even have wood. So you have sawdust incorporated in PLA and gives you a wood like feel so you can actually print wood okay. And you can print in titanium but that's that's not an easy thing you need a more expensive printer you need titanium dust but it's definitely possible okay. So if you look at the easily available techniques of 3D printing that is one is the FDM one and one is the SLA that is the resin type. So these two things are very inexpensive the cheapest ones of FDM are 15,000 rupees whereas the cheapest ones of SLA are 20,000 rupees. So it's cheaper than a smartphone. You can just gift it on somebody's birthday. My birthday is coming up okay. And uh, so it's a disruptive technology and it you, you can think out of the box and you can think of a design test it out if it doesn't work you can go back to the drawing board immediately change it and so that process of iterating designs becomes much much easier with this technology and mind you there are 3D printers on the international space station as well. So if somebody on the space station says oh no this thing broke people here on earth are going to sit and figure out a way to fix it they are going to develop the design they are going to email it to them they are going to print it there on the space station and use it. So that has happened they have had some emergencies on the space station where they broke a screwdriver and they said wait we will develop a new screwdriver and send it to you. And uh, it's very useful in education. So you can actually have these 3D objects for anything. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. Uh, 3D printing is very much in use in architecture and uh, you know the business of real estate. You can uh, have 3D printing in construction in the sense that there are now 3D printed houses which print with concrete. So that is very much there. IIT Madras did it recently. Several other par peop, uh, you know, engineering colleges in India are doing this one by one. I missed a few but past few months there have been a few more. So this is in India itself. So think what, what is happening in the rest of the world. A lot of um, companies are 3D printing engines also. So they are doing 3D printing in titanium for engines. Even in uh, automotive, in the automotive industry 
and then the, the, the main thing is it helps you in uh, iterative design quick iterations even food you can 3d print food okay so if, if you <laughs> yeah, maybe if, if you love cooking maybe you should learn 3d printing so that you can 3d print food in the shapes that you want and uh, outer space definitely very useful because you cannot send something from earth to there so you might order it from 3D printing Amazon or something and it would print on uh, the space station or on moon or Mars or wherever we are going to be in the next 10-20 uh, years. Dental industry, yes. Dental is very much into 3D printing. Lot of 3D printing happening there. So now we saw all the other industries. Let's go to the main part which is ophthalmology. Okay. So, so much, so much. So I'm skipping, skipping, skipping. Uh, Bioprinting is also there. Skipping. Now we reach ophthalmology so ophthalmology everything from the cornea to the retina to the external accessories that is the gadgets which we make planning surgical planning everything can benefit from 3d printing i have an article in kerala journal of ophthalmology where i have documented a bunch of 3d printing uh, no uses of 3d printing in ophthalmology kerala journal of ophthalmology this article then we have done a few other 3d printing projects also which we have published and uh, of course in Arvindai hospital the last day of my fellowship we got a 3d printer so we have been asking for a 3d printer for quite some time they said no you send it off to oral lab in madurai they will you know they will print it and send it back we bothered them so many times that finally they said you buy it yourself we give you the money you buy it and keep it there so we just uh, we just got the 3d printer on the last day of my fellowship we printed a fundus camera and gave it off to the uh, the uh, uh, so the next day was the hospital day so it was given to the chief guest dr rdr sir on the hospital day from the 3d printer which arrived the previous evening so that was there and after that there were so many 3d printing projects done in arvin this is one of them 3d printed eyeball for practice of wet lab for lasers and what not and uh, there was one which, which it can be, uh, it's flexible here, TPU material. So you can practice indentation in direct ophthalmoscopy. So this is flexible material. So you have different materials available. So if you have ideas on something to make, you just figure out what can be done. And if you know that this technology of 3D printing has this option, you can do that. You will be able to think better. You will be able to try out your ideas and figure out better ways to do things. So this is a 3D printed smartphone uh, microscope adapter which we had done with Dr. Ahmed Ateya. This is the world's first open source smartphone based retinal camera. You can just download and print it. That's there in, in Odox. This is the Odox one. This is the first one which we printed in Arvind Pondicherry. So we just downloaded it, printed it, gave it off in the inaugural, in uh, the hospital day and then uh, indirect lens adapter. There are multiple, multiple 3D printed and otherwise uh, fundus adapters. So, so many are there. And this is a slit lamp. So anterior segment also. You just need a lens inside and you can take anterior segment photographs. And now uh, Peak has a retina device as well. All these commercial wet lab model eyes are also 3D printed. So if you want to, you can 3D print them yourself or you can buy it from them. Uh, this is printed by Dr. Uh, uh, Prashant Girish, again Arvindai Hospital, Pondicherry. So this is that model. Uh, he, he was an IOL consultant with me. And then let's go on to, uh, sorry, skip these things. Yeah. And this is again uh, my website, not my website, my page on Thingiverse where I keep uploading newer designs. So you can just download these. So you can download the Aurora backwards drainage implant, you can download CTRs, you can download CTS. But mind you, these are not for human use right now. These are for wet lab practice you can, or, or for your PowerPoint presentation. You can put these in your PowerPoint presentations and move it around in 3D. Or if you want to do wet lab practice, you can just download and print these. Or if you want, like I said, iterative design, you can just download one think on how you can make it better and please give attribution to me because I put it up and then you know make a new design and you can just uh, go for commercialization also. So these are some of the 3D printed glaucoma drainage devices which I have done 
and uh, that was a BHEX. Uh, this is a project which was done by MBBS students. I was in Ramchandra Medical College in Chennai and the MBBS students there um, were interested in doing, they were, they were basically bored with ophthalmology. So I taught them 3D printing as well. I told them that these are the options available and they said, okay, we'll do some project. I told them you search on PubMed or something, find out some ideas. They said, okay, there's something called a punctal plug. I said, yes. What do you want to do with it? Can we 3D print it? Sure. And they designed a punctal plug and uh, you know we 3D printed it and we were able to use that. So, and this is the other thing. This is a glaucoma drainage device which I had developed there. So again, done completely by um, YouTube learning. Learned all this 3D designing from YouTube. And of course, you can use uh, 3D printed designs for contact lens fitting. I am going to quickly go through this. Okay, this is Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh's uh, 3D designs uh, for the um, the circle of villas and the whole assembly of uh, this for teaching basically. Uh, so these are 3D printable. You can paint it, do post processing so that it looks red, blood red. You can uh, you can polish them if you want to. You can do all sort of things with these. And uh, of course, um, many more 3D printed smartphone fundus cameras came out, including this ogle scope and uh, C3 Medtech, which was on Shark Tank. So there, all these things are available. Okay, and then what I did was I made an iterative design. So I already there were 3D printed smartphone fundus cameras. I made another one, the foldable fundoscope, which is a 3D printed one, uh, which folds and fits in your pocket okay so i found the last mile problem was that people were lazy people are lazy okay so if you give them a fold a fundus camera a smartphone fundus camera which is portable okay it is definitely portable you can carry it around they are too lazy to carry it around you need something which can fit in their pocket so that they don't have to worry about carrying it around also. They forget that it's in their pocket and then suddenly when they need to take a fundus picture, they just put their hand in the pocket, take it out and take a fundus picture. So that's how lazy people are. And that's, that's a fact. So people are lazy. If you give them the entire uh, do-it-yourself thing of how to make a fundus camera, they don't do it because they are lazy. Okay, not all people, but many people. So I'm not talking about the innovators here. Uh, so many people are lazy. So this is how I designed it during lockdown. I had nothing else to do but sit in Ramchandra Medical College with no patients in the OPD and uh, you know watch YouTube videos. So this is what I learned during that time. And uh, I happen to have 3D printers in the dental department there. So I use those uh, 3D printers. And in fact, there was an art, uh, there was an engineering college also. So I got to do some artificial intelligence work as well. So that is about the 3D printed funders cameras. Then you can use it for orbit work as well. You can practice surgeries. You can, you know, all these 3D printed models can be used. You can plan radiation treatments, so ocular oncology. I think Dr. Swati will be uh, talking about some of, uh, not this time, but maybe she will be doing this sort of work as well. You can even 3D print an OCT because this is not uh, practically of any use, but if you ask what can be 3D print, you can say, yes, of course, you can 3D print your OCT also. So just to demonstrate what it looks like, this is probably what is very interesting and very useful for many of you. If you want to develop a 3D printed surgical instrument, you just draw it and then print it, test it out, figure out what works, what doesn't, change it, again come back to the drawing board which is again your laptop, change it again, print it again, change it again, print it again and figure out what works. When you finally have a design that works, you go to the company or you patent it and then you go to the company and you manufacture it. So that process becomes much, much faster. It was never this fast, uh, maybe five, ten years back. So this is the best time to make instruments. So this is one such instrument, a 3D printed transconjunctival vitrectomy trocar cannula system. So very simple design, but you can test it. This is Dr. Sergio Canabrava. He he also said that he 3D printed the design first to you know get it uh, in the correct design, and then of course uh, reconstructive surgeries. You can have 3D printed uh, templates to use. So all these things, I think oculoplasty is going to be using all these things, uh, orbital limb. Everything is oculoplasty now. So I'm in that section. <laughs> 
and then teaching tools are so many like arvind eye hospital did a lot and of course there are prosthetic eyes i'm going fast because i am taking a bit of time so i am going to skip over the spectacles because everybody knows spectacles lvpi did fitel which is a which is a which is a puzzle for blind kids and uh, you can 3d print lenses also not with the regular printers but you can so lux excel uh, company has been 3d printing lenses also just because they can it's not cheaper but yes you can do it you can bioprint corneas so this is by a okay uk team team in uk a korean team also has been doing it and now lv prasad eye institute has 3d printed cornea so that is something which i got to know last week and uh, i think the bangalore team is also doing 3d printed corneas so north carolina so ev everywhere india is not behind we are doing it in uh, with the same rate uh, uh, same technology as korea and uh, uk and usa so this is pandorum in bangalore as well so that is going to solve a big problem so cornea people are going to be happy with that retina you can 3d print retina accessories for patients to put eye drops this particular thing is an eye drop helper uh, this is by dr shivagami in arvindai hospital uh, and this is again i went to back to the same thing so then we have a microscope simulator to show the patients this is what the lights look like when you are under the microscope so when you are doing topical faker you tell the patient see look at this light and this is how it's going to be don't worry so you just prep them before surgery so counseling patients arvindai hospital again and uh, this is another design of a eye drop helper by dr pawan so dr pawan is also a glaucoma specialist he devices for patients with glaucoma who are not putting their drops properly so thank you for this wonderful uh, opportunity dr thank Kinesh. you dr john for that wonderful talk and uh, we have a 3d printing uh, course going on in tstc yes. from 10 to 11:30 dr john is taking that we have a 3d printer over there 3d printing team is over there so anybody who wants to know how to do a 3d printing a full one and a half hour course just on 3d printing and uh, uh, they will help you out so i welcome everybody who is here to just uh, after this course to come over there and uh, get the feel of it so uh, next we are going to invite dr swati ma'am who is going to talk about artificial intelligence in ocular oncology a very uh, exciting topic right now a very good morning A very good morning to everyone present here. It's very good to uh, see a relatively uh, fuller hall. And uh, thanks, Neelish, for doing this uh, year after year. It's always a pleasure uh, to give a talk in this session. Uh, anybody in the audience, if they want to ask any question to Dr. John? in that meanwhile it gets up so i'll add that we have a 3d scanner also so if you want to get scanned into uh, the device you can do that i hope you have seen the movie tron where they get scanned into the device the computer scans the people yeah we can do that So the practical session is part of the TSTC. Uh, but we can, uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. Anybody can. Anybody is welcome who is into innovating. So we are not very hard and fast on that. Yeah. So Dr. Nilesh is in charge of that. I think what he is trying to say is that he is giving free complimentary registration for the attendees of this session, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. He has agreed. Okay, so now we have the slides up here. Let's move on with this topic. So I'll be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning in ocular oncology. I'm sure many of us um, have been hearing this term artificial intelligence much more in the recent years when compared to that of the past. And let's see what we have been trying to do in the field of ocular oncology, specifically uh, with respect to retinoblastoma. I do not have any financial disclosures to make. Now the use of artificial intelligence in medicine, it's increasing year after year. So if you even look up in PubMed, there are a lot of articles that uh, have been published about the use of artificial intelligence in various conditions, 
mostly it is in the field of cardiology, uh, even in field of general oncology, there are quite a few articles. And of course, during COVID-19 as well, it was uh, being used uh, extensively. Now, how does this artificial intelligence in medicine, how is it relevant? Now, whenever we have to apply artificial intelligence in any field of medicine, it, is, it basically depends on two parameters. Either whatever we want to create, it has to have a numerical data or it is based on the images, the various images of the different conditions. And fortunately for us in ophthalmology, these two things are uh, very much like you know, used for every pathology that we deal in ophthalmology. So with this, there have been quite a few articles about artificial intelligence in ophthalmology as well. I think the most uh, important being in the field of diabetic retinopathy. So there has been a lot that has been spoken about uh, artificial intelligence in diabetic retinopathy. And there are a few articles that are also published about uh, use of uh, AI in cataract and just one article about um, in oncology related to choroidal melanoma. Now, if we look at the load of ocular oncology, I'm talking of what we see at LVPI and probably would be true for any referral-based practice. Retinoblastoma is the very common diagnosis that we see. Either many patients are referred with the diagnosis or with a differential diagnosis of retinoblastoma. And uh, all of us are aware that it is a tumor that occurs in children. And unfortunately, in India, we see the cases in very advanced stage, like in group D or E. And this is mainly because we do not have uh, the guidelines of a routine fundus examination for all children as part of newborn screening or screening thereafter. And uh, it has serious implications because if the retinoblastoma gets detected late, the child might lose the eye. And if it gets detected even late, the child might even lose the life. Now, at uh, LVPI and in any practice where they see retinoblastoma cases, definitely there is a large image bank of the retcam images because every single child that is examined, we always take the retcam images. So there are a lot of uh, images that have been collected over the years. So with this and the use of artificial intelligence, we thought why not explore the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and try and develop a model where we can diagnose retinoblastoma and if we can diagnose retinoblastoma, whether we can develop a model which will also help us in classification of intraocular retinoblastoma. So here what we did was we put together all the, all the images that were taken on RETCAM. Now since we were trying to develop a prototype of this AI model, all the images were read by two experts as well and these images were also fed into the system to develop an AI model. Um, now for this, there are various parameters that were used, whether the AI model can detect the optic disc, the tumor, the size of the tumor, whether it can detect the seeds, whether it can detect, whether it can identify the distance of the tumor from the optic disc and various other parameters. For all of us, we understand that this is a normal fundus. So when you see that the optic disc is normal, the retinal vessels, everything is normal, macula is normal. So we know that this is a normal fundus and this is what we have to train the machine as well, that if it looks like this, it is normal. And group A retinoblastoma is when there is a tumor which is less than three millimeters in size. And how do we measure the size? I'll come to it later. Uh, so whenever there is a small tumor, it can be classified as group A. When there is a slightly larger tumor or if it is present in the macular area, it is uh, group B. If it is associated with small seeds near the tumor, like you can see which is circled in yellow, that's a group C tumor. If you see diffuse seeding, then that's a group D, uh, D, uh, group D tumor. And group E, of course, when the tumor is completely filling the globe. So with this understanding, the AI model was started. So multi-label classification model was used first to put a bounding box to whatever is seen in the fundus, be it optic disc or the tumor. So what you see there, the green one, is the bounding box whenever it can identify something which is not normal. So once we have the bounding box, it if the optic disc is seen 
and there is a tumor, it will compare the size of the tumor to the disc size. So we all of us know that the optic disc size is 1.5 millimeter. So it will compare that to the size of the tumor and tell us what is the size of the tumor. And if the optic disc is not seen, because in not all tumors that you can see the optic disc, by that you know that we kind of like to know that the size of the circle when we take uh, image, it's approximately about 12 millimeters. So based on that, it will give us the estimate of the tumor size. Then an open CV algorithm was used for identifying the region of interest. Uh, so here that is, this was mainly used for the identification of seeds because this is important again for classification. So here uh, you can see that uh, it is identified, the artificial intelligence or um, the algorithm that we developed, it, it can identify the region of interest and then it can identify the seeds that are present over the tumor. So with this model, the various parameters that um, it could identify was whether the optic disc is seen or not, whether there is a tumor or not, what is the size of the tumor if it is present, how many total tumors are present, if there is overlying vitreous hemorrhage, what is the distance of the tumor from the optic disc, if there are seeds and if there are seeds, how many seeds are there and what was the distance of the seeds from the tumor because all these parameters are important for classification of the tumor. Now the first, uh, when we started off this, we started off with 771 images in 109 eyes. Um, of these, 31 eyes were normal and 78 eyes harbored retinoblastoma. This was the manual image analysis that were done by two experts and as we can see it, the inter observer variability was very minimal, it was less than 1% and the, the inter, inter observer variability for the cumulative classification, I'll tell you what the cumulative classification means in my next slide, it was 0%. That means there was very good, um, uh, like you know the same analysis was done by both the experts. Now what do you mean by cumulative classification? For example, if the AI model or if any of us are just looking at this picture, we say that, okay, there is no tumor here. Yes, there are dilated vessels that you can see in the superotemporal uh, quadrant, but there is no tumor. In the same eye, now let's look at the image a little inferonasal. Here, when we look inferonasally, we see that yes, there is a tumor. Yes, there is a seed that is right next to it. So what will you classify it as? You'll call it as a group C tumor because there is a tumor and less than three millimeters from the tumor is a seed. So it falls into group C. Then if we look beyond, so we are moving in all directions, so when we look beyond, there are more number of seeds that are present. Now because these seeds are more than 3 millimeters away from the main tumor, now this gets classified as group D. And we look further in the superotemporal quadrant where there are dilated vessels, there is a larger tumor with diffuse seeding that is there. Which means that every image, it gets grouped separately depending on what is seen in that particular image. But what is the cumulative classification for that eye? So whatever is the highest classification you get becomes a cumulative classification. So it's basically a group D eye. So using this model, the accuracy in detection of retinoblastoma, that means it could differentiate whether the eye is normal or whether the eye had a tumor. Uh, it was 95% and accuracy in classification of retinoblastoma as per group was 85%. Um, of course, it's not that it is perfect. There, uh, there were few missed diagnoses, which is uh, definitely a matter of concern because you do not want to be missing a tumor uh, in an eye which harbors it if you are planning to use it as a screening tool. So missed diagnosis was present in 3% of the cases. Over classification, that means if it was a group C but it got classified as group D or higher was in 9% cases, under classification was minimal which was less than 1% and misclassification of a normal eye as an, as an eye harboring retinoblastoma was 2% which again is a matter of concern. So overall, the sensor, if we look at the sensitivity and specificity, the sensitivity for detection of retinoblastoma was 96% and specificity was 94%. Um, and for overall grouping, the specificity was relatively good, ranging between 91% to 100%, while the sensitivity was not up to the mark, where it ranged between 63% to 100%. So in conclusion, the artificial intelligence model is definitely a promising tool for the diagnosis of retinoblastoma. 
it may be useful in the classification, not just diagnosis, but also classification of retinoblastoma as well. Of course, the strengths are that this is the first AI model that we developed for retinoblastoma, and, and in fact, this paper has been published as well. And now we have um, put in more fundus pictures from different races as well, not just the Indian race, because it has a very dark fundus, while you see in the Caucasian race, it has a very orange fundus. So we just want to see if the same model can be applied uh, when it is a different colored fundus as well and it can definitely if it can it can serve as a useful screening tool because you cannot every the oncologist cannot go into the fields and see the fundus of every single child so if we can develop this as a, a screening tool it's definitely useful it certainly has high sensitivity and specificity for detecting uh, for differentiating the normal versus uh, retinoblastoma. Here, the caveat is that, of course, it's not that it can differentiate between a Coates disease and retinoblastoma or a PHPV and retinoblastoma. It can just differentiate between a normal versus a retinoblastoma because this is the first stage. Um, yeah, I think we have talked about the limitations. So this we have already started doing to increase the sample size and use other machine learning models to improve the accuracy. So the ultimate goal is that when and when the fundus of, if the fundus pictures can be captured by any field worker and they can just be sent to a reading center and uh, the AI model can do the image analysis and tell whether it's a normal eye or if it's an RBI. And if it's an RBI, uh, automatically it should uh, prompt the person that, okay, this child needs to be referred to an ocular oncologist so that early diagnosis of retinoblastoma can be made. And if it can classify, of course, it will also help uh, us help them to make the parents understand the urgency of referral and also talk about the treatment options. Um, here is an example, like, you know, if you show this fundus, it should tell us that this is a normal eye, so this child does not require referral. But when it sees something like this, this, in fact, was, an RO, uh, was a child who was preterm and was just being screened for to rule out ROP. This child did not have ROP but had RB. So if uh, these images uh, like you no know, got sent and by the reading center and if it can just say that okay this child has retinoblastoma and needs uh, treatment immediately and that remains the ultimate goal. So thank you very much for a patient listening. So thank you ma'am. Uh, so uh, for everybody in uh, layman terms, what artificial intelligence means, it sounds very intimidating, but it is just having, uh, you are having an atlas in your OPD, uh, and when you get an image, uh, when you see a patient, you what you do is you uh, mentally you try to match it with that atlas, that okay, this is this is a coronal ulcer that looks like fungus that is shown me in the atlas. So it's very similar to that, but uh, the machine does it very fast and it does uh, match, match with a lot of images that, that have been fed to it. So the more number of images that what ma'am was telling, the more number of images that are fed into the atlas, the more robust it becomes. So it's in simple term, it's just matching from an uh, a, a atlas to the image that is thrown to that system. So uh, uh, that is what artificial intelligence basically is. Uh, uh, moving on to Dr. Prakhat Rupsa's talk, uh, Prudence is protecting uh, IPA. Morning to one and all. Uh, I'll be speaking about uh, the prudence in protecting our intellectual property. So basically, uh, the question after you have realized your idea and you are innovating on that idea is whether you should go for patenting it or you should keep it uh, without a patent, keep it like an open uh, source. So basically, I don't have any financial disclosures for this presentation. I have divided my talk into two aspects. First is to realize the worth and value of your own idea. And then you have to analyze whether is it worth patenting or not. So the worth of your idea, the protection of your idea, the value of your idea is to be decided first. Now the worth of your idea is basically depending on the need that it is addressing. What is the felt need in the society among the practitioners, among the patients for that problem? So if it is a realized problem that clinicians are facing, the patients are facing a challenge and you are solving it, it's important. You have to see how relevant it is in the clinical practice. What is its impact on the patient's lives and how essential is a solution to this problem, how unique is a solution to this problem. 
you also have to look at what is the saleability quotient. That is, what is the magnitude of this problem? Is it easy to administer or use this product or this invention? So will it be uptaken fast? What value does it add to the current practice? Does it disruptively change the practice pattern and is that disruption going to be easy for the practitioners to uptake or is going to add another challenge and make them, uh, you know, stay away from changing their practice. Again, uh, the uniqueness or monopoly is a very important factor in determining the value of the idea. So patentability in essence is a statutory uh, requirement wherein basically what you're saying is your idea is novel, it's new, it's non-obvious, meaning that it is not something that is 2 plus 2 becomes 4. You have to have some inventive step that is completely unique. It's not a, uh, a coming together of various existing ideas. That is obviously the inventive step in your uh, innovation. There are non-disclosure agreements which can uh, basically help you in licensing with other partners or your collaborators without having to go through the uh, whole process or exercise of patenting. But practically, if you are engaging with somebody, even with a non-disclosure agreement, it's not as good a protection. It's practically futile if the intent of the collaborator is not nice. One has to look at the various stages of filing a patent and they have different expenditures. So you can file a patent in India and then you can file a PCT application that provides you a three year, uh, a three year bracket where you can decide which individual territories you would like to patent your product in. And these have increasing costs. India patent will cost around maybe 30, 40,000 rupees and a PCT application may be costing around 1.5 lakh and then individual territories would be much costlier. So one has to consider the cost while going ahead and planning at what stage they are going to do which process. We have to explore the scope of patent with respect to its maintainability and its cost effectiveness. Maintainability meaning how much can somebody work around this uh, patent to get a new product that is not covered by your IP? And that becomes a challenge. To drive this uh, point home, I am going to use a simple example. So to determine the value, first you decide what is the quantum of need. That is, is it a single use product or is it a reusable product? A reusable product is less likely to be uh, giving you enough value in the long term if you patent it because somebody who is going to reuse it is going to buy it once. The cost of IPR actually adds into the cost of product. So one has to decide if that is a viable thing to do. One has to look at the existing competition. So basically again the option of what are the alternatives, how novel or how disruptive is the idea and is it going to drastically change the practice and be uptaken very fast. And lastly, the possibility of bypassing it. So I will take the example of two instruments or uh, two devices that I designed. One is the ND ring, which is an implantable device, a secondary implant that goes in the sulcus to treat negative dysphotopsia. The other one is a chopper, which I designed for my own phaco surgeries. So if we look at the ND ring, the main value of the product lies in the idea. It lies in the design of the invention. The manufacturing cost itself is quite low. If we look at one piece of the product, the cost of making it is very, very cheap. The marketing cost is high and it is a single use product. That is, once it's implanted in the eye, it's gone. So one has to buy a new one. We look at the chopper. The value does lie in the idea, but the inventive step is not that great a thing that it's, it's a small incremental change. 
the manufacturing cost is significant. If we look at the instruments that we buy, the raw material and the machining of it is actually quite costly and there are not that much margins. The marketing cost is low. You will, you will rarely find somebody advertising a chopper. You will only find it at the stall. It is a reusable product and once you buy it, it's going to continue with you for years. So if you look at the ND ring, we had to first understand the etiology, make a 3D model on the ZMAX ray tracing software. Then we designed a secondary implant that simulations and everything would go on. And eventually we find the right prototype, manufacture the prototype, test it, do a clinical trial and then it becomes a product that is worth using in the eye. If you look at the chopper, I send this drawing to the manufacturer or if I would know how to 3D print and John would help me, I would 3D print it and then I would see it, use it and if there are some changes, I would get it done and that's the end of it. So the only change that I did in the chopper design is adding this bend which changes the vector forces during the chopping and makes my life much, much easier. So if you look at the process, designing the ND ring and getting a usable prototype in itself is a very complex process. It involves a lot of uh, interaction with heavy machinery, industry, implantable devices, regulations, things like that. And the idea is difficult to circumvent. You cannot, uh, you will not get a very, uh, very quick idea or a very small workaround around this idea and bypass the intellectual property. But if you look at the chopper, the design is easily modifiable. I have added one bend, somebody might say that, you know, this works better and add another bend to it or do something else to it and make a new product. So basically to maintain the patent of the chopper is difficult. First of all, it will be difficult to convince that this is a novelty. And secondly, even if you get the patent, it is difficult to maintain it because somebody else will change some things and bring out a new chopper. So in the ND ring, like I said, the cost mainly lies in the R&D and the selling price can be dictated because it is a unique product that addresses a very big problem. When you have a patient of negative dysphotopsia that is sitting in your clinic and you are afraid of doing an explant or an exchange of IUL, you have this option of just going in and putting this sulcus implant in a pseudophagic patient, you know that you are going to go for it. It's not the cost that is going to matter to you. While if you look at the chopper, suppose I patent it and the patenting itself costs me 10 lakh rupees for the major territories, that costs add to the product. And so when you go to buy your, your chopper, that chopper is going to be much costlier than its competition. And it is a price sensitive product. So it will remain unpopular if it is that costly. So the choice that one has to make is between patenting or not patenting it, but popularizing it. So the advantage that you get with patenting is that you get the credit, the name stays with you. You get your uh, due recognition for giving that novelty, giving that inventive step to the practice of ophthalmology. The other advantage is that you can easily go in for collaborations with other people and that uh, you don't have to worry about uh, the credit going away from you. The third is obviously the monetization aspect. You are able to monetize it, get your royalty or whatever, get your due for that idea. The disadvantage definitely is that it increases the cost of the final product and it, because the costs get higher, the popularity of that product may remain less. Thanks a lot. I would request everyone to please scan this QR code and download the AIOS app. And if you find this IC useful, please rate us on this app. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, uh, him having two products, one patented, one non-patented gave us a uh, uh, quite a good idea of uh, what we should patent and what we should not. So uh, we have move on to the last talk of today. Uh, that is by my guru, Dr. Ashish Sharma, marketing yourself, your innovation and your passion.
So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, some audience. You know, we have been doing this course since last three years. And every time our time slot was 8.30. So 8.30 was uh, something, you know, which was a uh, uh, little disheartening because uh, we were prepared, but we were not seeing audience. But today we do see audience and uh, thank you Nilesh, uh, almost couple of years. So we have done, uh, you know, wonderful chit chats and uh, regarding innovation and how to take things forward. So I would talk briefly about, you know, what Nilesh had asked me to do because I might not be the right person for marketing perspective, but he says, you know, sir, the way you have taken your product to 67 countries, I think that's uh, something that we need to talk about and see in, as a person without support of any kind of advertising agency, how can we take it forward? So I would definitely talk about it, but take it with a pinch of salt because there are few things, you know, where we went wrong, probably those could have been a little better. So marketing yourself, your innovation, your passion, how to make it a global impact. So this is based on the couple of products that we have and one already received patent last year after six years of patent application, am I at CAM? And uh, it took six years because I, I was hoping that we get it early because the entire uh, proprietary right, it is starts from the time when you file it but you receive it after six years, so actually your intellectual property duration becomes really, really less. So these are few of our uh, disclosures. I do have financial disclosures to disclose in this talk. So lessons from our marketing journey, now it is 67 countries in the last three days. So most powerful tool at this point is WhatsApp communication. No wonder that WhatsApp was bought by Facebook at a humongous cost because that was a quite a forethought that people would be seeing WhatsApp communication you know, in each second. That's what we do. So this is some communication which is direct, especially for the audience where you have a product for a kind of group. It is not something that you have, uh, you are selling some clothes which attracts each and everybody. But here you are selling something like ophthalmology products. So you have a certain group like AIOS members, like state members. So this is something which is the most powerful tool in our experience till now, which we have started exploring since last year. And I would like to explain to you about this tool. What happens? You must have seen this WhatsApp marketing many a times. You must be receiving some messages. People who use WhatsApp marketing, there are some vendors who can do WhatsApp marketing for you. But what happens? If you do not go in an organic way, if you do not go to the right person, you keep taking numbers from where you send these messages and, and anybody who says, I don't want to receive this message, I'm annoyed. Your number is blocked. So you must have seen a lot of people are, even our you know, AIOS uh, voting also, you see a lot of people are marketing with different, different numbers. You see one guy, you receiving message from different, different numbers because their numbers are blocked. So now what Meta did is, Meta has made it official. Now you have a platform from Meta and there are multiple companies which are involved like Wati, where you pay to the Meta for advertising and it's a quite an org organic advertising. There is no failure. So you have 23,000 AIOS members in the list and you reach to each and every one without any failure. So this is the most powerful tool that we could see. Other tools, Facebook, social media, Instagram, this gives you a visibility, but this does not give you a value in terms of saleability because the audience is not organic. You do not have people of only ophthalmologists sitting and seeing this. I love LinkedIn. Personally, I love LinkedIn. Why? LinkedIn does not give me saleability, but LinkedIn give me collaborators international collaborators, LinkedIn give me scientific value. If I patent it, if I present it in different countries, LinkedIn give me visibility for sure. So that also you need to keep uh, working towards LinkedIn because if you want to take it to the global, you definitely need to work around with different countries. 
and that to the KOL of those countries. E-commerce present, you can have this that presence, but to fairly speaking of ophthalmology products, this does not work great because the audience which is sitting right there is not your audience. That audience is probably looking for an undergarment or probably a shirt or a t-shirt, but very few people are looking for your product. So we have our product in both these platforms, but in our journey of last five years, we have hardly 1% of business from there. Whatever business comes, that is from the WhatsApp marketing. Google Ads, we started with them. Email campaign, Neelesh was maintaining Gmas because that was something which was available five years before. But what happens with Gmail marketing? You do market, you have approximately opening rate of 5%, 10%. So essentially you are not reaching to anybody. And even if it is delivered, you have a lot of emails being delivered in the junk. So people don't even see it. So that was a problem of email campaign. You pay for it, but you are not getting the desired result. Now dealers, we failed here. I, I was telling you in the beginning itself, I would accept our failures also here so that you can learn from our failures. This is the traditional marketing that everybody has been doing since long, long time dealers. Our experience is nil till now. We are present in 67 countries just by presentations, oral, digital marketing, WhatsApp marketing with the colleagues, global collaborations, and a lot of studies. But what happens with dealers? If you go, you know, if you really see, you know, this big, big market, then probably this is the right approach because a lot of people want hands-on. So your dealers can do that. Probably the problem with the dealership is you lose a big margin with them. So you lose approximately 50 to 60% of margin with them. But if you really can do a good e marketing, then you do not lose that margin and your margin is eroded by just 10 to 15 percent. So, so you save a lot. And right now this is an era of digitization. Everybody is sitting on Facebook, WhatsApp. We check our WhatsApp after every 15 to 20 seconds. So that is the most strongest marketing. So I would say hire a dedicated e-marketing team. So that is something which can work wonders for you, not only in India, but across the globe as well. Nilesh asked me to talk about briefly that how to make a global impact. Conferences, collaboration, as Prakyat said, you know, regarding intellectual properties, we have intellectual property rights, you know, received on one product, applied for three products, but it does not work. Apple and Samsung can fight, you cannot fight. You do not have that pocket to fight against patent infringement. So rather than worrying about patent, patent what gives you as Prakyat said, it gives you collaborators, it gives you scientific value, it gives you a grant, it shows you that you were the first one to do it, but it does not give you protection I would say for which it is meant for. So how do you really go ahead from your competitor is by making your mark everywhere wherever you are. Go. So when we started MI Red Camp, we were everywhere. We were interviewed by Academy even when we, our product was not ready in 2016, 17. Then we were in the courses of American Academy. Then we were on the front pages of major high index journals. So that is the way and if innovation comes from a doctor, it's a big plus because you can correct it on a daily basis in your clinic if somebody engineer who's designing it, he would have a hard time to really test the product. And you know it, you know the scientific value, you can reach to your collaborators. So your collaboration becomes really, really easy. So in that way, so these are our publications on our you know, devices or whatever we have done till now. So we strongly believe that scientific content is very, very important. Now, we have a lot of uh, competitive products with us. And somebody, when they call me, that's, I find something which is cheaper than this. My answer is only one. Kindly Google that name and kindly Google the name of my device. You will get an answer, then come back and talk to me. So that you get through your scientific acumen. And involvement of West is essential. You know, whatever you say, as a developing country, we listen to the West a lot. So this is one of the study which was published in 2023 by my dear friend P. 
Peter Campbell, who is a great pediatric ophthalmologist, they, he, the, he and the Madurai Eye Centers, means Arvind Eye Hospital 5, you know, they have gone together, and this is the data that we published that with our device and with the Clarity Red Cam, which Swati was talking about, if you really talk about the treatment referral ROP, the sensitivity and specificity as good as. If you get those answers from those people, your value further goes up. So on this note, I have a sincere thank and acknowledgement to all the collaborators across the globe who has been helping us to make the global impact of whatever we have done till now. Lot to do further. Thank you so very much for having me here. And this is my last slide. As Prakyat said, what innovation does, what patentability does, it leaves the footprint of your journey and it makes sure that your journey is worth following by somebody else. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful talk. And uh, we are actually at the end of ICV, at end of our time. So uh, what we would like to invite all the audience, because uh, this is the first time we, we are seeing such an uh, interest in innovation and uh, 3D printing and AI. So I would like to invite all the audience to join us for a photograph before we disperse. And we can move all the uh, discussion in the foyer so that the next uh, IC can start on time. Thank you.